ปุทัสสะภะคะวะโตอะระหะโตสัมมาสัมพุทธัสสะอะปารุธาเดสังมัตสะทาวรายโสดวันธาบมุญจันทุสดังเรื่องนี้มีเรื่องนี้มีเรื่องนี้มีเรื่องนี้มีเรื่องนี้มีเรื่องนี้มีเรื่องนี้มีเรื่องนี้มีเรื่องนี้มีเรื่องนี้มี
with uh, with us all the time. Now, when we when we think about dhamma in terms of formal dhamma teaching, sometimes we forget this. We we get abstracted into ideas, you know, our views about dhamma and uh, definitions and perceptions that we hold, and we don't we we sometimes we don't trust our own direct awareness and intuitive sense in regards to what's right, obvious right with us all the time. So we, we find it because we're so educated to, to think and to perceive uh, in cultural patterns and conditions that uh, we, we tend to trust views and opinions or ideas, definitions, uh, doctrines, teachings, and all this much more than we trust our own intuitive sense. So during this retreat, an encouragement to learning to trust your own intuitive intelligence, which isn't, which you can't define it, you can't find it uh, as something that, uh, you know, that you can, uh, see as an object. You can't perceive it. You, it's the simple act of being. Um, aware. And then, how do you be aware? <laughs> and, uh, we have to describe how to be aware, but it's not, you know, with all the descriptions and, and clever ways of, of expressing, uh, views about awareness, that still is not it, is it? It's, uh, it's your own willingness and, uh, to trust in a direct knowing the present, the Pachubana Dhamma, here and now, the way it is. During this retreat, also, the, the, the word retreat used to, it brings up various perceptions of meditation retreat means, you know, absolute silence, uh, uh, control of everything, uh, trying to, uh, you know, keep, keep all the, the noisy things out and, and really develop samadhi and got to get something. You've got three months now to really get something and, and you've got to practice hard. Uh, you've got to really, uh, you know, work hard at your meditation. That's one way of looking at it. Seeing it as more like a, a, a an ordeal that you're being, that you're engaged in, which you have to to really uh, tough it out in some way and uh, control everything, try to to keep uh, anything that is uh, worldly, annoying, tempting, uh, obnoxious, disgusting, or unwanted away. So that's the the control mode of like retreat. That's how we used to give them. In fact, remember uh, ten years ago. So I gave one of the last retreats I gave with that with this with this uh, really hard line theme uh, was uh, was a disaster. <laughs> Because, uh, you know, it was, I was impressed by how willing people were, were committed to doing it. But, but at the end of the day, I didn't find much wisdom coming out of it for anyone. Because, uh, it's more like, like a, you know, just forcing yourself, uh, making yourself do something, uh, an, a, you know, enormous effort and and uh, discipline and so forth that that went into it, but the result was not very good. And so then the the word winter retreat became almost you know for some people like oh my God another winter retreat, and just the word winter retreat became a you start contracting with fear. You think, I don't know if I can take another winter retreat. 
<laughs> because that's the, your experience is the total misery that that is relieved at the end of it. You, you do get a good sense of relief, like hitting your head on a brick wall. You know, it's so nice with the feeling that when you stop hitting your head, it feels good. But is that the the way? <laughs> Is that, you know, is that a skillful way to, to, uh, to live our lives? Then the, then the, uh, idea of trusting yourself, this I, I've been emphasizing over and over because I, I realize that that's, that's the thing that we most lack is because of the, uh, because most of us come from from very kind of worldly backgrounds or uh, materialistic cultures and we uh, societies that that we see things in uh, in a certain way and we conceive ourselves or perceive ourselves endlessly on in terms of personality or character uh, we we love to have we love to have types, uh, you know, identify with the different, uh, perceptions, views. And many, uh, many of us have, see ourselves through our faults. There's a tendency very strongly to see yourself through what you think is wrong with you. To, to see yourself as weak or not good enough or unworthy or not pure enough or selfish or inadequate in some way. <clears throat> So as long as we we operate from these kind of uh, perceptions of self, then of course we, you know, we we can prove, you know, make a through strong determination and and hard discipline, we can maybe get a, a kind of more sense of I'm I can take it, I'm can endure, and I'm better than I think I am. But still, the basic delusion is there. The, the whole attitude of a self. It's never questioned, but only uh, is our basis, our modus operandi for for experience. Lung Pa Cha used to always describe meditation as a, a holiday for the heart. And so uh, he's a, this was a, my translation of, of the Thai, Pak Pon Tang Jit Jai. And, uh, uh, holiday for the heart. And so, uh, but the way I used to hold the meditation when I was in my early days with Lung Po Cha <laughs> was anything but a holiday. <laughs> it was, it was an ordeal. You know, I really prove myself, drive myself, force myself. <clears throat> So what does it mean, holiday of the heart? Does it mean this is not a holiday? This is <laughs> so then a holiday or whatever is a, you know, as I say, when we think of the word holiday, it's a, it's a, a resting, a relaxing. Puck porn in Thai, you'd like to relax, take it easy. Uh, a heart, a relaxed heart, a sense of being at ease. Of trust and, and being at ease rather than, uh, the hard line of I've got to get something, I've got to get rid of something. <clears throat> I mean, I've got to get samadhi. My samadhi is lousy. I've got to get better samadhi. Or I've, uh, I've got to be more mindful even. I've got to, um, Purify myself. I've got too many impurities and I've got to get rid of the impurities. So even the, the Dhamma teachings we can hold in a very stiff way that just intimidate us. You know, this sense of I'm impure and I've got to m- make myself pure through hard work, through discipline, through striving, through struggling, uh, is, uh, is very much, uh, you know, the way we, we tend to view our lives. I'm 
my impurities are me and uh, because of these impurities I've got to do something about them to try to make myself pure. Or it is the word enlightenment. Some people don't even like the word or liberation or nibbana or the the words that we use for uh, reality, for ultimate realization can be uh, you know, it can be we can feel so separated, so distant from that reality. And especially if you see yourself in that with that self view. So you know, I can I can't see how I as a personality can ever be pure, personally. <laughs> personally speaking. <laughs> it uh, it just the uh, you know, I can, I can think pure thoughts and, uh, and hold on to ideals of purity, but then I can't sustain it. I can't, you know, I, I can, you know, maybe even convince myself I'm purified, but it, I can't hold it. It doesn't, it's not something that, that I can rest in, that I can totally trust, just by, by making myself, by controlling my mind and making myself into what I think is purity. So in this uh, resting, the sense of relaxing, taking it easy for this retreat, doesn't mean that then you think, oh, you mean we're not going to have any discipline? Or no? We've got to hold it together, we've got to control, people can't talk, we've got to, you know, we've got to... Do something because the the uh, thinking mind then feels that if we if we lose control if we just relax we'll all just sleep through the whole three months <laughs> sleep and eat because uh, <laughs> taking it easy sometimes uh, relaxing that's what we think is relaxing is just kind of uh, you know lying about doing whatever we feel like. But there is a form of this retreat, and in its uh, and we refer in a tradition, we have monastic tradition, Dhamma Vinaya. So these are, you know, we can. How do we hold these? You know, are they intimidating perceptions that we use to, to you know, or do we do we grasp them and 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 uh, conceive them and then. Uh, then personally measure ourselves according to ideals that we get from reading the Dhamma Vinaya. <clears throat> so as long as you keep thinking about it and 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 keep uh, defining yourself in with adjectives and so forth, then uh, you're bound to that level of you know how do you get beyond it? Because that that realm is is uh, it, you know it just goes around and around. I call it samsara. You know, it just one thing connects to another, and it just goes around and around until it drives you crazy. So, as a person, as a personality, doesn't mean I I I, I have no personality. But to what is that which is aware, the awakened state, naturally awakenness, awareness, intuitive awareness is very natural to us. It's not a state you create through controlling or holding on to anything. So like Pakpon Tang Jitjai or, or Holiday for the heart isn't isn't uh, you know striving, forcing, controlling, manipulating, holding on. But to me, it's like just the act of trust, of relief, of just letting the burden go. Whatever you think you are, or your views about winter retreat, or Amravati, or about me, or anyone else. 
We're not, we're not denying or defending any of this, but this is not the point the, to, to keep trying to, to figure out everything on that level, but to trust in this natural state. An alertness, attentiveness in the present. So like right now, all of us are conscious entities. This is the experience of consciousness. So then the, and consciousness the, is, is a natural state. We don't create consciousness. It's, it's natural to this realm, to the, the state we're in. So it's not a personal, uh, attribute. You say, my, my consciousness, Ajahn Tomato's consciousness, things like this. Consciousness is not, has no personal quality. Doesn't belong to, to anyone. And you can't, you know, it's not, not red or blue or, or even Buddhist. Then it's natural to this state we're in. Being born in this realm is the experience of consciousness. And yet we can be conscious and not aware. So, you know, as we get conditioned, then we, we, we lose that perspective, our discerning ability to see things as they are, because we, we, we create illusions that we hold on to that affect our conscious experience and then we experience life through those delusions. So I want to say on a personal level, if I'm if I attach to to myself, if I never break down, crack that delusion of I am this body, this person here, then I then how I interpret everything, all experience is a highly personal interpretation. Me and mine and what I think and feel and my emotions, my thought, my body is the, is the way I interpret, uh, conscious experience through this illusion of a self. Then the Buddha encouraged it, said, wake up and see the way it really is. So this, this sense of awakenness, you know, it's, you can't, you can't, it, it isn't dependent on conditions. It's, it's, it's a merely, we forget it when we get lost in our delusions. And so even though we're, we're all equally conscious, that consciousness easily gets distorted through the way we perceive. And that's why there's so many crazy things in the world. People doing so many, uh, horrible things. You, know, you read, you hear the news or read the newspapers and there's endless kind of strife and struggle and, and fear and, and, uh, corruption and selfishness and stupidity that seems to be everywhere. <clears throat> And people can, can, you know, you can get really distorted through being just so totally obsessed with, with some maybe horrible perception. And seeing everything is evil, and you can get into annihilation, you've know, got to destroy the world, or uh, what's happening in, in India and Pakistan right now, just the way, uh, say, one country perceives another. You know, just the thing. Seeing the Pakistanis and the Indians uh, you know, through these distorted perceptions, and then that leads to can lead to a nuclear holocaust easily. You know, if we if we just go along with that perception. We are committed to it. We can justify. It. We can prove it. We can give all kinds of justifications for even the most atrocious act. So you can't trust that, your perceptual 
conditioning, you know, you know, your way you think and, and emotional habit. But what can you trust right now, here and now? Is in awareness. This is the only thing to take refuge in. And it's natural. It's not like you, you, you know, if you think I've got to get jhanas in order to get it, then you're stuck with that view. You know, I'm, I'm somebody that is heedless, without good concentration, and, and in order to really, to realize nibbana, I've got to get a lot of concentration in order to do vipassana, insight meditation, and, and that then reinforces this sense of I am somebody who doesn't have something, who's got to get something. And that's the, the sakaya ditti or personality view that, that is so convincing and, and real for most, most of us. But not that these things are even wrong, you know, the views or they may even be wrong or it's just the way we grasp them out of ignorance, out of lack of awareness through habit and through, through, uh, starting always from the self view. I've got to get something I don't have. I've got to get rid of things that I have that are impure. I've got to become enlightened in the future. I've got to practice hard in order to become and attain. So we grasp that and then what happens? No matter how hard you try, you end up, you know, feeling this despair because uh, it's like, you know, you're trying to get, you're trying to get hold of something and even if you get something, you're going to lose it. You know, so if you gain through discipline and concentration practices some, some kind of blissful state that seems very pure, because of the basic delusion has never been seen through, then, then you feel a great sense of loss when the conditions don't support such, uh, such, uh, say, high levels of concentration. So we can get very, you know, obsessed with controlling, trying to keep out noises and distractions and threatening uh, experiences because it makes us lose our concentration. It upsets me. I get feel shattered and and uh, by by the the disruptive conditions and. And, uh, and uh, here I've been, I just got it, I got my samadhi, and then suddenly somebody comes in and says something, and I get really upset. It's their fault then. So then we blame, <laughs> we can blame, you know, the people at, or the, the condition. <clears throat> so contemplating or reflecting on this, that, that, uh, Starting from an enlightened position of just awareness, rather than thinking of attaining some idealized state of enlightenment, and if we if we if we create enlightenment as something we don't have that we've got to get, then then that then then we we we. Whatever we do, we're trying to attain something we've already preconceived, rather than trusting in uh, in in the natural state. A natural state is enlightened, so it's not like asking asking you to attain something you don't have, or that any of you here are so you know you know don't have it and some do. Because then that's back into that realm again of me and you and and uh, quantities, qualities, the conditioned realm. So this is why during this retreat, this 
uh, encouragement to trust more. This sada or Pali word sata is it's a very simple thing of trusting. And when I say trusting yourself, I don't mean your personality, because your personality can say all kinds of things and and go all over the place. So you can't trust your your views, opinions, emotions. But what can you trust at this moment? And then the, for me, the, this this is the this awareness sense of openness, receptivity. Very simple, very natural. Then you say, well, you enlightened Ajahn Sumato. <laughs> but that's not the point, is it? That's a pointless question. But in terms of practice and trusting, this, uh, this is a, uh, this is a natural state of purity. Enlightenment that isn't personal. As soon as I claim it as some kind of personal attainment, that's very misleading. And that it, it's, uh, then it goes, it goes back into that mode of I, I've attained something through my many years of monastic life and practice and I've achieved and attained something. And, and then that makes you feel, well, you know, I'm just a, a new Anagari car and I, I'm, I'm all over the place and I don't know what. Ajahn Sumedho, well, he's been a monk all these years, he's over 35 years now and, uh, so then you start perceiving yourself as someone, uh, who ha- who hasn't, who, who's impure, who has, who's not enlightened and perceiving, maybe perceiving me as somebody who is. But that's not the point, is it? It's the, the, the reality is here and now. It's not a personal attainment. It's nothing to do with, 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 uh, how many years you've been a monk or a nun or whatever. It's how much trust you put in this moment to just receive this moment as is in all its aspects. So like an intuitive moment embraces, you know, it includes everything. When you start thinking, then you're, then you divide everything. The the thought process is divisive. And uh, that's its very nature. It can't help it. It's just the way thinking operates. Uh, You can only have one thought at a time. And then, you know, so you, you can't, you have to think this thought which connects to another, it goes, well, you know, in tandem. So you have, you know, you, you have one thought moment, another, another, another. So when you, when you conceive yourself through thought, through definition, through perception, then you, you are binding yourself to, to the limit, to that limitation of always feeling separate, divided, and that very sense of separation and division is dukkha, is the suffering of the first noble truth. Because to be, feel separate, you know, even just that simple, even when you're feeling good and separate, not when you're feeling depressed and separate, when you're feeling good, even that, if you, if you know, I notice even even when I'm happy, there's still, and, and I'm attached to that kind of happiness, there's, there's something still unsettling about it, unsatisfying. Until I trust again in the awareness of it. So, an intuitive moment, then, here and now, Pachubana Dhamma, is very simple, very natural that we can only recognize through trust. And that trust is 
even if you're all uptight, tense. Just open to that. Allow things to be what they are. You know, not even to think, I have to learn how to relax in order to trust. Then you get, it's all complicated again. So if you're all tense, painful, um, frightened, whatever, and then, then you assume you've got to, you've got to make yourself fearless and relaxed, then, then it becomes complicated, doesn't it? So, allow things to be tense, uptight, Brighton is like this, in, the, in an embracing, a welcoming sense of allowing things to be, the condition realm to be what those conditions are. It's not, not up to me to, to try to refine the conditions and, and manipulate them and, and control them, but I, know, I have this sense of, that's not it where it's at. I don't have to strive to try to get rid of this or change that or get hold of something but the sense of relief of of pakpon tang jitjai of holiday for the heart so I'm not just going to fall into a heap and fall asleep on the floor or not be able to attend the morning puja or anything (laughs) because I'm so relaxed I, the 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 intuitive moment includes the conditions and the and the conventions that we use. So they're not there's not not an attack on the on tradition or convention or on formal meditation practices or on meditation techniques or anything like that. I'm not putting down jhanas or or meditation uh, techniques that you've learned. It's something to that you should just throw them out or. They're all a bunch of rubbish. It's learning to trust in what is normal and natural, which allows then the conditions to to not dominate our conscious experience. We're not overwhelmed or or obsessed with the with the quality of the conditions that we might be experiencing, because our relationship to them is one of embracing, welcoming, an intuitive acceptance rather than a critical uh, analysis of them. During this retreat also, it's like, like uh, I see my role in this retreat as as someone to encourage rather than to teach you. Because this, uh, you know, you see me as a teacher, then, then you might even grasp what I say or whatever, and then, then you, 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 you try to, to, uh, meditate according to the Ajahn Sumato technique or something like that. <laughs> and uh, that's not what I encourage. It's not a, mental state that I want to encourage because what I'm encouraging you to do is is a kind of imminent act of trust there's a lot of fear in this realm that we live in this planet earth and this universe is very frightening to us so, and, and, and being in a community, living with other people, and, and, uh, the, you know, we, brings a lot of anxiety or fear into the mind. Recognize that, that, that this is a, a frightening realm in terms of the conditioned quality of it. Much of it's survival of the fittest, isn't it? It's, uh, it's learning to, to to survive, get by as a creature, get enough food to eat and shelter and protection. We've got here in 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 uh, here in Britain, we do. We've got we can take a lot for granted because uh, it's uh, you know fairly 
well-run country with conditions that we, you know, we can easily take that our meal every day for granted. We don't have to go around scrounging for grains of rice. Just to, to, to have an, just to survive for another day. Or to fear a lot of, like wild animals or even bandits or, um, terrorists. A lot of parts of the world, there's a lot, a lot of terrorists. <laughs> so, but here, this is, so far, we've been saved from that fear. So trusting then allows, is, is a way to, to get perspective on fear rather than trying to get rid of it. Or to control everything that, that make us feel safe. But recognize the ultimate safety is in awareness. And this is, uh, uh, you know, like in terms of people that court dangerous, uh, activities like, uh, um, Rock climbers, or jumping from parachutes, or or doing very you know doing very dangerous activities. They're quite popular, you know, to do to to court something that is life threatening because um, in in those situations where where you're physically challenged to. Uh, where you're, it is a matter of being aware or not being aware, you're aware. If your life's in danger, you're physically threatened by something, you, you know, there's something in it, the in, uh, instinct takes over and you just, you know, you don't have time to worry about what somebody thinks of you or anything like this. You're just immediately present to be fully with the, the step where you're going to put your foot next or your hand. <clears throat> Because this uh, bodies are very damageable, vulnerable things, so they this is this is the way it is. This realm, there's you know, when we think about it a lot, and there's a lot to fear in it. But if we think of ourselves that fear is is my problem, then we then we make it more than that, isn't it? We operate from a basic delusion that I'm frightened rather than fear is like this. Or anxiety or discontentment or whatever. So that why we call it a refuge. In Buddha Dhamma Sangha is the, the formal sense of refuge. Uh, but this really implies boiling it down to awareness is the refuge. In a safe situation, like now, say, retreat mode, say, we don't have a lot of duties and things to occupy us to keep us busy. Because one way of of getting rid of fear is by distracting ourselves in something else. You know, so, you know, boredom or, or discontentment or despair or whatever. We, we can distract ourselves by, by doing something or, or getting involved in some activity that we can absorb into. But a retreat, like monastic life, is, is a, its kind of quality is that it it gives us a lot of time, space. With nothing to do but sit or walk, stand or walk, or lie down, to breathe, to be, you know, there's not, so that they, these are kind of, these we don't, you know, if we aren't uh, aware, we tend to ignore the the basic things that that are happening to us by involving ourselves, distracting ourselves in various activities, or if we we give up on that, we just get depressed and 
we just want to drug ourselves out of existence or or just sleep or we can't operate anymore because we 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 don't know how to wake up or trust in anything or in trust in awareness. So during this retreat, I shall, this will be my main encouragement. Because it, I, that's what I can do, in the, how I can, I see in terms of my role in this community, is encourage that. I can't make you. <laughs> because that doesn't work, you know. Be, be mindful. <laughs> 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 command it uh, or order you to be mindful because that gives the wrong message isn't it a commanding order uh, intimidates you you can go back into the self reaction of oh god he's always telling me to be mindful <laughs> so it needs to come from encouragement uh for, and, and to trust. And when you, when you see yourself getting into compulsive habits and fears and, and, um, meditation habits even, just be, you know, because we even, it's easy to fall back into these, these, uh, habits. Just, See it also whenever when you catch yourself when you see suddenly you're you're operating from willfulness or from obsessive compulsive uh, tendencies. Just welcome that the attitude is not to, to even disparage yourself from doing that, but the sense of relaxing and letting it be. Let compulsiveness be compulsive, but your relationship to it then is with awareness and wisdom rather than identity on a personal level. We're all adult people. So, you know, to give the impression that the, you know, the, it gives the impression I'm the wise one and you're the, the student or you're just the, you know, this is kind of teacher student relationship. Contemplate that. If you see yourself always as my student and I see myself as your teacher, then we, then we get caught in playing that role. Uh, and we easily fall into those the you know it's easy to we're used to that we're always thinking of ourselves as I'm a teacher or I'm a student and 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 that identity uh you know because that's a conventional way of looking at this uh, scene here but that's not what I'm encouraging is is for you to be my student and I'm your teacher but for uh, to trust in your awareness of the way you, the way that you you do react when you're put in a conventional role, and I'm in a conventional role. So, in we this encouragement then is is. Getting to the real teacher, in the Hindu, in the Vedanta, they call it the Satguru, or the the inner teacher, the wisdom that comes through awareness, trust in that, rather than in the words of uh, that I have, that I speak, or in in what you read in the scriptures.
Now, emotionally, we might feel very threatened by such talk. Oh, my God, I can't trust anything myself. It's all over the place. So, you, you know, we're not used to, you know, we're, we're used to, to the delusions of our society. So it's easier to play the role than to awaken. And as so many of us come into monasticism, we, we like to play the role. And, uh, you know, get, identify strongly with, with our role in the Sangha, with our position, with our seniority, with our duties, with our position, titles. <clears throat> and that's very easy to do because that's how we're conditioned to think and, and interpret experience. We always see ourselves in terms of monks and nuns or senior and junior and lay people and men and women and on and on like this. It gets the, these, it's so easy to fall back into, into that pattern because, uh, that's how we're conditioned to think and experience life and interpret our experience. So the trusting then is is not is not a personal refuge. It's not male or female, monk or nun, or lay man or lay woman, or Buddhist or Christian or anything. It's not not it has no name, and it's here and now, totally natural, relaxed. Trusting, and allowing whatever you're feeling physically or emotionally to be what it is, rather than judging and trying to to change it in some way through some ideal you have. This encouragement to, to see each other in this way, you know, to, you know, as a Kalyanamita, as a friends, as, as, a, as human beings that are, are, we're, we're all here for the same reason. And our moral agreements on behavior are this way. So we have the, the, uh, precepts and the vinay and so forth. So this is, these are conventional agreements in regards to, to the, um, way we live with each other. <clears throat> on the, on the, con- con- in the conventional world. But identity with that, also creates enormous division. So, you know, when we identify with with these perceptions, then we we we're back into the samsara again, the realm of suffering. So the convention then is is you know like if you're an anagarika or a Lay person, or Siddhadara, or Bhikkhu, junior, senior, Mahatera, Chalkun, or whatever. This is, this is, uh, these are conventional, uh, really conventions that were, that, that are, that are present. Rather than identities that we assume. So in this practice, it's not a matter of how many years and how skilled you are at meditation and, and whether you're, you know, you're all that, led such a good life or not, but how willing you are, how much trust you can, 
you can have towards this simple act of awareness. Simple simplicity of relaxing in the present, opening, receiving life as it, as you experience it through your senses, through your mind. So then, consciousness is informed through wisdom rather than through ignorance. So the consciousness then, this experience of consciousness is then something that reflects reality rather than uh, some something that um, separate, something that we can claim uh, or divide or measure in any way. So then uh, the word panya or wisdom, the panya comes, arises from this awareness. The more we trust it, then, then wisdom is the Sadguru that, that, that informs our experience rather than having views and opinions about through why, through reading books about wisdom or having wise teachings that you attach to. So in this way, the, we're, we're, the common, the common ground is, the, is awareness consciousness. Now this is, this is the point of the way it is. This isn't some abstract idealism that I'm kind of holding up to you. And this is for, you know, for you to recognize and begin to really appreciate and treasure and value the, <clears throat> this opportunity of awakening. Of course, emotionally, we're not primed for this. Emotions are, are conditioned through, through habits, through extremities. You know, so that one can feel very threatened or very bored or very restless or very negative about, you know, once, you know, being aware because we, it, it, the emotional reaction can get very, uh, you know, once you have a level of awareness and peace, and the emotions can start you know, boring and uh, peace is boring, isn't it? They all cry for peace, peace nicks. You know, we want peace and harmony, but then if everything's too peaceful and harmonious. It's boring. You know, you're watching these videos. You don't, you don't want to watch a video that's just peaceful and harmonious. <laughs> <laughs> sitting there watching an enlightened monk being totally peaceful. Because, uh, you know, emotionally we, we quite, you know, we like the excitement, the, the, the blockbuster, the action man, the, the, the romance, the adventure. <laughs> Excites and, and, and stimulates. So, and that's emotionally what you know what we're primed for is is that kind of. of uh, we can refine it. We can develop more refined tastes in the conditioned realm. We're, but uh, generally speaking, still we're still left at the end of the day with uh, with you know ignorance and suffering. So, uh, 
trusting in awareness, and versus the more the thing is, is as you begin to appreciate it, recognize or re, it's to realize these words like realize or recognize. It's not that you, any of you you don't have it or you can't get it. It's just learning to recognize, pay attention, reflect on the way it is. So in the the morning, uh, I'll do these reflections, these ways of of uh, encouraging uh, you to uh, trust and to to recognize, realize. Consciousness with awareness. Panya. We have our Vipaka Kama also. So, in, you know, that's the, the, th- the way we react to things and, and, uh, uh, that are quite individual. You know, so this, this is, uh, so these things come up when the conditions arise and this condition appears, you know, so, if in the, when those conditions cease, then it disappears. So, recognizing this, this, we can, we can open with awareness to the karma of this moment, whatever it is, in any personal way. <clears throat> like if I go and ask each one of you how you feel right now, you'll come up with different, you know, different ways of interpreting this moment. The consciousness is the same. Not my consciousness is has LP Samato written on it and is unique to me. But LP Samato is a perception that that uh, generally I respond to or react to. <laughs> or me sitting on the high seat here, you know, being the master, the meditation teacher and so forth is uh You know, the, the, this is this is the, the the conventional position, the the vipaka gum of my life. And then I'm on the high seat. <laughs> but then, if I identify it with, uh, you know, in terms of I'm LP Samato meditation master and all that and you are you're my students but well, that's coming out of attachment to to the to the convention but if i don't no longer interested in that convention you know i'm willing to the the, the, the parka kama is like this the, uh, this role this position i'm in is due to the kama so then it's not, it's not taken as some kind of personal, uh, acquisition or, or way of holding myself, but recognizing it for what it really is. And then each one of you with your different feelings, emotional reactions, physical, uh, conditions, whatever they might be, as, this is the vipaka kama. So our relationship to it now is is welcoming, accepting, opening to the vipaka kama rather than identifying, trying to control it, get rid of it if you don't like it, trying to hold on to it if you like it. So then the meditation it is the simple act of of faith, open awareness, attention, attention, using the conditions that are obvious, the body, the breath, the sensations, 
being able to even your emotional state or sound of silence, the space in the temple, the space, the silence. These are all here and now. And even when you leave the temple, there's still space wherever you go. Even if you're in a little room, there's space in the room. And space, in the room is in the space. So we're, we're, our, rela- our way of opening includes. It's an inclusive rather than an excluding one. So in we, when we trust in this, then we, we begin to notice things as they are. So we can investigate the body or the, con- contemplate the breath or whatever. But it's in, but it's coming from, uh, no longer from some kind of personal attitude about it or identity, but using the way it is, willing to allow and let the, this moment be the way it is, physically, mentally, emotionally. And trusting that. And even your, you know, the desire to change it or struggle, you know, what, allow even the struggle to be the way it is. Or the, the boredom or the despair or or the uh, uh, compulsive sense of uh, the compulsive, willful habits that we we bring to meditation. I'm not trying to get rid of them and say you shouldn't you shouldn't have compulsive uh, you shouldn't be willful and give you give you suggestions like that, but recognizing that that this kind of compulsive need to do something is like this, the way it is. So that's uh, I hope that this evening's reflection will benefit you and uh, so that you you know this this seems to be a very auspicious winter's retreat and a fine group of monks and nuns here and Anagarikas, Anagarikas, and wonderful lay support, and on and on like this, there is, uh, you know, the, it feels very good. I feel very, I feel very good, very happy to be, uh, able to be with you at this time. So this evening is, even though it's uh, one part, we're not. Uh, I'm not encouraging you to sit up till midnight, but because I'd like to start at five in the morning, uh, as usual, and uh, then uh, during this time to to uh, just see, recognize how you do hold this. Uh, whatever way, you know, positive or negatively is not the, not the issue. But you're trusting in your, in, in, in your ability to open to it and, and recognize, realize the way it is. And accept the conditions that you're experiencing as they are rather than struggling against them. Is there anything I should? Oh, yeah. Yes. So we can, uh, say start at 8.30. After breakfast, there's puja at five and then 
8.30. Then during this time also, I, you know, in terms of silence and, uh, you know, the way we can hold noble silence can be real tyrannical form of tyranny. So, you know, I've been on retreats where people go around checking on you and going, shh, you're not supposed to talk. That kind of thing. And this is, you know, where this is, this I find, uh, is like treating you like a bunch of school children. And, uh, so, so it's, you know, the way we hold the idea of noble silence and can be, you know, just, a, you know, um, don't you, those people are talking, they shouldn't, we can get ourselves into a real twist around that. To recognize that, that the silence is, is, you know, this is, this is encouraged, it's a noble silence and not a tyrannical one, or an obsessive grasping of silence. So, and we're all taking responsibility for, for how we live in this community. You know, you so I trust you all to, to use the with satipanya rather than, than, uh, you know, have a police force going around trying to, to keep everyone in control and that. This, this is, this is something when we, I find, you know, if, if I'm, trusted and treated as an adult, I tend to rise up to that level. And if I if somebody starts browbeating me and telling me and and trying to control me, I tend to sink into that <laughs> level. So you know the, the life in the Sangha is is uh you know it's it, it's for uh it's a beautiful life in which we're we're taking responsibility for our lives, for how we live, for what we say and do. And so we we to, to trust each other, to have this sense of trust and respect, rather than endless demands on how we should behave and what we should or shouldn't do. And to me, this this is, you know, resonates as something. Then we, I find, you know, people rise up when they when they're when they're encouraged to, and in ways that even surprise. You're used to being, you know, ordered about and controlled. Uh, then we, you know, sometimes we feel safe when there's a strong, you know, teacher who's who really, you know, has his eyes on everybody and checking them out all the time and and uh and gets around to seeing the scene, what's going on in the common room? And the nuns behind what what are they doing over there? And uh what a kind of uh intercom or kind of a, this tape, you know, to see if they they're talking about things they shouldn't or have a spy system set up. We can have meetings in the after breakfast and say who's you know, who should we who's who's the loose cannon in this community? <laughs> who have we gotta put in their place, discipline, tie down, lock up at the police state. <laughs> but recognize the beauty of our life is uh, is uh, this encouragement or the of awareness, wisdom that we we can never fully uh, recognize if we're always treated as if we're little children and irresponsible and need need to be controlled. 